Without Pompeo in the race for U.S. Senate, the seat is Chris Kobox to lose. That's the result of an internal Republican poll. Plus, racial profiling, how Wichita is doing in solving this problem, and where it can still improve. And after years of problems at the state's mental health hospitals, could Kansas be on the verge of a turnaround? That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. Hello, everyone. This is Kansas Week, and I'm Chris Frank, sitting in for Pilar Pedraza, who is getting her master's diploma this evening at Pittsburgh State University. Well, Kansas mental health hospitals are in a shambles, but could 2020 be the turning point when things start getting better? Wichita Eagle asked this week if a better financial outlook for the state and Governor Laura Kelly's priorities could be good news for the state's mental health hospitals. The Eagle reports the state hospital at Larned has fewer than a third of the nurses it's supposed to, 20 out of 67, and only half the doctors, 7 out of 14. The open positions have led to huge overtime bills for the state, adding up to an average $4.5 million a year. Meanwhile, at the state's other hospital in Osawatomie, admissions are limited to less than 170, even though the facility is licensed for 200. That's due to federal safety concerns from numbers of people in a room to the ability to minimize the risk of hangings. Right now, new patients can only be admitted as previous patients leave, often leading to long waits in emergency rooms across the state for beds to open up. The state estimates the cost of building a new hospital at $100 to $170 million. But last week, Governor Kelly approved pay raises at Larned, running from 2.5% to as high as 20%. And with many lawmakers saying mental health is a priority this session and the state facing a billion-dollar budget surplus for the next fiscal year, the money could become available to repair or replace Osawatomie. Well, joining me on the desk this week to discuss this and more, we have Senator Larry Alley to my left from Winfield, and we have Dr. Neil Allen, a political scientist from Wichita State University, and former state representative and gubernatorial congressional candidate Democrat Paul Davis. We want to thank all of you for being here uh, to, to talk about these important issues. So starting with you, uh, Mr. Davis, how urgent is this issue and how did uh, things get this bad here in Kansas with the mental health hospitals? Well, this has been a, a pretty dire situation, unfortunately, for a long time. And uh, the, our state hospitals have been woefully underfunded uh, for decades. And frankly, the Democrats and Republicans are, are both responsible for that. Um, we even saw the Osawatomie State Hospital lose its federal accreditation. Um, and so uh, this is a serious situation, uh, but I think that there is some good news here. Um, as the state budget situation has improved, uh, it has given uh, the state the ability to uh, provide some uh, strategic pay raises and uh, try to see if we can attract and retain uh, more people at state hospitals. I mean, right now in Larned, Two out of every five positions uh, is vacant. Uh, they have some natural challenges in Larned because Larned uh, uh, is not close to a metropolitan area, and that that is a real issue. But that's uh, got to be a challenge. It, it's yeah. something um, that you know really everybody in the state ought to be concerned about. You talk with people in mental health, you talk with people in the court system, and you know they'll tell you their frustrations uh, with the state hospitals, and uh, you know in particular. Uh, Osawatomie has had a cap on the number of patients that they have been able to uh, receive at the facility there and as a result you know there are people who need to be there but they're being housed in jails they're being housed in hospitals and and that's a problem in many many Kansas communities right well Senator Alley is the budget surplus that has been talked about is it reliable enough to help make some of these fixes and maintain the fixes. Uh, as you saw on the earlier, it was between 100 and 170 million dollars to fix 
like I said, uh, the problem with that. And our budget surplus is, in my opinion, a short term, short term, short lived. Right. Because in about uh, two years, we'll be back if we continue spending at the rate we're spending today we will be out of money again. So it's going to take, uh, if someone's to do something about this, it could take a tax increase. I know there have been proposals. One proposal is maybe look at uh, regionalization of our uh, hospitals instead of having, uh, maybe have a couple beds or a couple facilities in central Kansas right. and uh, look at uh, some other facilities other than Osawatomie because it's been, it has been maintained for a long time. Right, and these, like you say, these funds, uh, not certain how, how these funds can be maintained, and, and even some are talking about a potential recession, but of course economists, Dr. Allen, they uh, predict recessions often, even though we're in a record uh, bull market. That's right, and also though, one way to think about mental health um, is it's an, and spending on mental health, it's, it's, it's investment. Mm -hmm. Because if you can treat somebody from a mental health problem, particularly if it involves a drug addiction, now, then you will save so much money later on in additional mental health costs, law enforcement costs, and and also the kind of the the and if you can get that person back into the workforce and actually paying taxes themselves, and this would seem to be a time to do that. But we shouldn't think that just because we have a budget surplus now, we're going to have a budget surplus for the next 10 years. Right, because there are, there are plenty of other problems and others who will be clamoring for that money also. So I'm sure we'll be coming back to this. Moving on to another story, Governor Laura Kelly says Kansas is open to new refugee settlements. So does Dodge City, uh, and Dodge City agrees with her, but why are they making these uh, statements and what impact does it have on refugees looking to call Kansas home? Corin uh, Griffith from KSN's Capitol Bureau explains. On average, from 2008 to 2017, more than 67,000 refugees came to the United States each year. For the upcoming 2020 fiscal year, President Trump has set a limit of allowing just 18,000 refugees to resettle in the U.S. And I'm like, my yay or nay brings a family of seven out of a storage container to a new life in America. It's yay. Dr. Sophia Khan has been helping refugees to the United States for years. She even helped the first Syrian family to the United States after President Obama allowed 10,000 refugees to come to the U.S. Saying that, God, I know these people need the help and the community wants to help. Khan created the nonprofit KC for Refugees that helps with everything from paying bills to finding clothing and food. We have literally been just sharing our own things with these people that have moved here and we still have a lot to give. I have to say no to people when they now call because I say there are not enough refugees coming. President Trump signed an executive order that now gives states the ability to refuse refugees. Governor Laura Kelly sent a letter to President Trump saying Kansas is open for refugees. I think it says a lot about the character and, uh, and how uh, honorable the people of Kansas are. They are very hardworking people and I know, you know, that our community needs them. At the Capitol, I'm Corinne Griffith. Well, for cities like Dodge City and Garden City, refugees and other immigrants uh, have been keeping the towns alive. And, and Dr. Allen, is this part of the answer to rural revitalization in Kansas, perhaps? It, it, it's part of the answer for some places. So Garden City, Dodge City have rapidly growing um, economies based upon industries that attract a lot of folks. Um, uh, there's no magic bullet for rural prosperity in general. But also, in thinking about refugees and the kind of American experience, we're sitting here in Wichita, and this is a city that uh, that has many of its most prominent businesses that were started by Lebanese refugees mm -hmm. to this country, um, and coming partly because of their particular uh, country across the world was not a safe place to live in at the time that when these folks and their ancestors came. And so in America, we are, everything that we do is built at some level upon people fleeing a place where they had trouble living. Um, but it's really, but it's just the problem of living in a world where people can move. Right, and maybe maybe there are industries there that that are readily 
able to uh, integrate uh, new people with, with the skill sets that they have in, into to those industries. What kind of impact, uh, if any, a refugee resettlement uh, will have on surrounding communities? Uh, either you, uh, Mr. Davis or Senator Alley? Well, one thing I saw uh, when I read this story but with Governor Kelly was that she said these refugees would be vetted and properly vetted. So we'll make sure that, that they are. Uh, the second thing is I was pleased to hear that uh, she said that the local communities and the counties and the cities would have an impact or a input on where they're going to be located mm -hmm. because it is a strain on the infrastructure. Uh, we have to house them. We have to, you know, you have to have jobs for them, school systems, health care. All of this is, uh, would have to be taken care of wherever they move to. And so that's uh, an issue that uh, the communities need to be aware of when they go in. Right. And that happens any time. I mean, I remember uh, after the end of the Vietnam War, uh, there were refugees uh, into Wichita, and, and there, there can be uh, uh, a burden on the education system and language barriers and things like that. So we have to keep that in mind, right? We certainly do. And, you know, when you look ar around the world at what's happening in, in different places of the world. Um, a lot of upheaval. You know, uh, Central America and, and countries like uh, Honduras, uh, where, you know, gang violence is just literally out of control. And people just uh, are, are not even near feeling safe in their communities and that's why they're leaving and they're trying to get to places like uh, the United States and uh, you know we've always been a, a welcoming country we, we are a nation of, of immigrants um, and it, as was pointed out earlier you know we've allowed 60 some thousand people who are really designated as, as refugees which is a little bit different from uh, from what you what you see as other immigrants that come to the country and that number has been reduced substantially um, during uh, the Trump administration. And now you have an executive order that says, well, states, you, you can make these decisions. And you've seen governors uh, all across the country that have, uh, have spoken up uh, uh, like Governor Kelly did. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the things to, to just keep in mind is, is that, you know, th th this is a complex and it's an emotional issue. I mean, a lot of people have strong opinions. I hear people who say, you know, by golly, we are a nation of immigrants and we need to let, let, let anybody in uh, who, who needs to be here. And then other people who say, well, w you know, what about, uh, we, we can't just accept huge numbers of these people. And, and, and this, is, this is what, uh, you know, lawmakers, uh, Senator Alley and others uh, in, in Topeka, and in, in Washington, D.C. Are, are having to deal with, and, and it's a difficult issue. To find the balance b uh, between those. All right, well, we'll be talking about that, I'm sure, more. But moving on now, the Kansas State Board of Education says vaping should be banned at all schools and school events. The board voted unanimously Tuesday to treat e-cigs like other tobacco products. Alec uh, Gardner from KSN's Capitol Bureau takes a closer look at what this means for your school district. Public schools in Kansas could lose accreditation if they don't ban vaping on school property. That could lead to a loss in funding for the district. The State Board of Education voted unanimously Tuesday to treat e-cigarettes like any other tobacco product in Kansas schools. We're often asked, why are you so focused on, on vaping and why are you not focused on just smoking cessation? We've been focused on that for years, but we've never seen numbers like this before. Many of the, the schools have fairly robust uh, tobacco-free school grounds policies, um, but, but very few of them included um, uh, vaping devices. The new recommendations ban the possession of e-cigarettes by all students and staff, and bans vaping for all visitors on school property or at school events. We'll do everything we can to set the standard from a state level, and that will trickle down into our local communities so that everyone knows how serious we are about the detriments of vaping. Next, the Board of Education will decide what's the best way to punish students caught vaping vaping at school and how to help them quit altogether. They're also hoping lawmakers raise the age to buy all tobacco products to 21 in the state. Reporting in Topeka, I'm Alec Gartner. All right, so uh, Mr. Davis, does this burden schools or does it give them more tools in a fight that they've already been in? 
Well, it is a fight they've already been in with uh, with other types of tobacco products. Um, you know, we're seeing deaths from vaping, and uh, we're seeing some pretty profound statistics about the the number of young people uh, that have taken up vaping. And uh, uh, you know, I, I think this is a step in the right direction. Uh, every school board in the state's going to have to revisit this. But uh, as was mentioned, if if they don't go along with the policy that the State Board of Education has recommended, uh, they're going to lose their accreditation and uh, that's going to have some very serious consequences. I, I, I want to go back maybe to a Motley Crue song about smoking in the boys room. I guess it's not even a, why would it be even debated whenever it comes to, to any smoking, whether vaping or anything else, especially with all that's gone on in the past six months or more. Right, but also to think about the kind of administrative costs there are to this particular kind of policy. So that at the end of that package, it showed somebody vaping out of what looks like a flash drive. And so I have uh, two kids in Wichita Public Schools. Both of them have done things in school settings that involve flash drives, something that looks identical to something that could be vaping um, mm. uh, tobacco. And also, the college students that I teach, they talk a lot about how the, the biggest problem uh, in a lot of public schools now in Kansas and everywhere else is vaping of marijuana. And telling one product from the other is very difficult. And so I'm in support of this personally because I think anything that we can do to stop somebody from, from smoking when they're 14 years old is something that we should do. Right. But however, though, this is a, this is a lot of work on, on schools. To, to figure out what is a vaping uh, pen and what is something else. And maybe real quickly, uh, do you think that uh, this the vaping legislature, there will be vaping legislation uh, in the coming uh, legislative session? I'm, I'm almost certain there will be something on vaping uh, because you know the problem arose when they started adding additives to the, the vaping liquid and they could add their nicotine and there was no control over how much nicotine you could put in. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the manufacturers found out we can attract younger students by putting flavor in. Mm -hmm. And so there's where the real uh, problem lies. It, it attracted the younger students and uh, it's a real problem and it needs to be corrected. Yeah. We'll be uh, addressing that, I'm sure, in the coming months. Well, moving on to another story, Wichita's Racial Profiling Committee presented a new study on the problem to the city council this week, showing things are starting to improve. The study analyzed traffic tickets written in Wichita from 2016 through 2018. It showed the total number of citations police wrote dropped from a high of just over 114,000 in 2007 to only about 42,500 last year. Most of that dropped coming since the arrival of Chief Gordon Ramsay. At the same time, they found that African Americans still account for between 21 and 23.3 percent of the citations, despite being only 11 percent of the population. And African Americans were twice as likely to be pulled over, though they were st st statistically less likely to get into an accident. Well, Pilar Pedraza took a look at this issue for Cake News. When Cake News investigates walked into this barber shop on the northeast side, it was just like the prison system. As long almost everyone in the room had a story about racial profiling. And it's you know still a nervous uh, type of energy when the police get behind me, and I don't have anything to hide or anything to be scared of. It's just you kind of get conditioned to it after a while. African Americans say it affects how they live their daily lives, even where, when, and what they drive. Dr. Walt Chapel says he ran into racial profiling after adopting an African-American son and seeing how often his son got pulled over. We have very little tolerance for people who look different from us. For the last several months, chapel has been looking at three years' worth of traffic tickets in Wichita, finding that while the city is issuing fewer tickets, African-Americans are still getting a disproportionate number of those traffic citations. And we're finding that their blacks are more likely to get a ticket having to do with a non-moving violation than whites, nothing to do with traffic safety. Wichita police disagree with Chapel's conclusions. In a statement released immediately after Tuesday's presentation, the chief said an internal review of the data showed discrepancies and inaccuracies, which will require further review. 
The department says the chief will sit down with Cake News Investigates to discuss their report once that review is done. We checked with Dr. Michael Berzer at Wichita State University, who studied racial profiling for years. You can have an overrepresentation of a certain race or ethnicity, but that doesn't necessarily get get you to racial profiles. For me, a better a better estimate is who's not getting stopped and what's the driving population look like. He believes greater transparency from officers about why they've pulled someone over might help but agrees with Graham, more minority officers will make a big difference. You're more likely to give somebody a pass who you can relate to, who you may even recognize or know from somewhere, or at least give them some direction or some guidance than somebody that you've never had any kind of, you know, interaction with. Pilar Pedraza, Cake News, investigates. Well, other than uh, changing recruiting methods, uh, how do we change this? What are other ways that uh, we have to, to end this problem because it's been something that's talked about for years and years. It, how about you, Mr. Davis? It has been. It was an issue that uh, we talked about a lot uh, when I served in the legislature, and it's, it's something that is really frustrating um, in uh, minority communities. Um, and, and folks like me, uh, you know, we, we don't understand these issues very well because uh, we've never been in that position. And I think it's uh, important that uh, you have uh, law enforcement officers that look like communities uh, so that people have uh, some trust in the communities and you have leaders in law enforcement um, that are really willing to, to educate um, their forces uh, about what racial profiling is and make sure that they are they're aware of it and, and that they're not doing it. Yeah. One other question now. Chapel directly connects racial profiling to the state's suspended uh, licensing problems and is pushing for a statewide amnesty. Uh, is that something that could move forward this year? In, in your thought? I, I think that uh, this whole racial profiling needs to be, uh, you can sum up to what would solve it, would be education, mm -hmm. education of the officers, education of the public, training, more training for the officers and about uh, when they hand out tickets and in transparency. Uh, I have three good friends that were in highway patrol. Highway patrol is different than the officer in the street here in Wichita. However, when they're stopping someone, they're doing it based on uh, situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Is this guy weaving? Is he speeding? Is he slowing down? Whatever. But they don't know when they, when they turn their red lights on if it's a male mm -hmm. or female, black, white, brown. They do it because of what the car, and I think that's what WSU, mm. the gentleman's on here, said something about that a while ago. Yeah. All right. Hey, we've got uh, one more story to, to get to and to discuss. Uh, turning to the Kansas Senate race, the Republican primary is co-box to lose unless Pompeo gets into the race. That's what an internal poll for the National Republican Senatorial Committee shows, according to the Wall Street Journal. Thursday, the Wall Street Journal released the results of an October internal GOP poll on the Kansas Senate race. It showed that former Secretary of State Chris Kobach is the frontrunner in the Republican primary for the seat Pat Roberts is vacating. Without Pompeo in the race, 43% of likely primary voters said they would vote for Kobach, with Congressman Roger Marshall getting 24%. State Senate President Susan Wagel getting 8%, Wink Hartman 5%, and Dave Lindstrom 3%. 16% of voters remained undecided. But with Pompeo in the race, the poll found 54% of the likely voters picked Pompeo, with Kobach trailing at just 17%, Marshall at 11%, and everyone else under 10%. The poll had a margin of error of plus or minus 4.1 percent. Well, the poll is from October, and Dr. Allen, this is uh, right down your alley, has much changed in the political landscape since then. Well, certainly yes, because we're now in the middle of an impeachment process um, against President Trump, and Secretary of State Pompeo is very closely connected to President Trump, and President Trump is, is a positive figure among Kansas Republicans. Um, and we should also be careful about overinterpreting a primary poll. Things can move a lot in primaries because the differences between the candidates are smaller 
And so voters might be willing to jump from one to the other. So Marshall is behind in that poll by 19 percent. There are plenty of examples of candidates catching up. Although if it's that kind of race, though, that probably takes money and a lot of it. Oh, yeah. And, um, but also it, it looks like the Republican Party establishment is just desperate to find a way to stop Chris Kobach from being the nominee. And so this is a poll to try to indicate that. Um, but also, we shouldn't think that just because Kobach is up by 20, 20 points in a poll that's a month and a half old, where most of the other candidates haven't got a chance to introduce themselves to the public, that this is where it's going to stay. Mm. Does this increase the possibility of uh, Mike Pompeo entering the race, in your opinion? Well, a, a poll like this. A poll, I don't think so at this time. I think that uh, it's, it's good candidates on both sides of the, of the ticket. Uh, the poll show. Kobach leading today, but uh, like you said, uh, a lot of things can change in the last, in a, in a week. Right. And so I believe that uh, what we need to do is just let the primary play out and we'll look at who's a, who comes out on top. But is there, does this uh, bolster Democrats who, who feel like, hey, th we may have a chance of, of catching the Senate race here in Kansas the first time and what, uh, Couple of generations, at least. 1932. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's been a while. I it was back then. <laughs> it has been a while. Well, you know, Democrats are uh, enthusiastic about uh, a possible opportunity here because uh, they saw Laura Kelly defeat Chris Kobach in, in the governor's race, and uh, they see that possibility again. Um, you know, I do think uh, you have to understand that uh, state races are different from federal races, mm -hmm. and um, you know, Kansans are usually a little bit more inclined to uh, to vote for Democrats at a state level uh, than at a federal level. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think what's going to be determinative ultimately is 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 who is at the top of the ticket uh, for Democrats. Um, if it is somebody like. Joe Biden, uh, who um, you know is more palatable, I think, to mo most Kansans uh, for a Democrat, uh, you know that improves the chances. If it is Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth uh, mm -hmm. Warren uh, that I think is going to struggle, uh, then it's it's a different race. All right. Well, a lot of great subjects that we've we've uh, discussed this evening, but we're going to have to leave it here, and and we know that this is going to be a moving target for uh, the months to come. We want to thank again uh, Neil, Larry, and Paul for joining us. We'd also like to thank our news partners at KSN News, Cake News, and the Wichita Eagle for their sharing the materials with us. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. We'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on today's topics or future ideas for shows. Just email us at kansasweek at kpts.org. For now, have a great week.